testimony special generation of leaders to whom we owe our freedom and to whom we owe our commitment to keep building the South Africa to which they devoted their all. Dr. Freeney Jinwala was born on the 25th of April 1932 and was an anti-apartheid struggle icon. She devoted her life for the attainment of democracy, equal rights, and uniting the people of South Africa. Dr. Jinwala served South Africa's democratic dispensation in a diversity of roles as a lawyer, academic, political leader, activist, and journalist. She was also the founder and convener of the Women's National Coalition, which comprised of organizations from across the political spectrum with the aim of drawing a women's charter. For most South Africans, we have known her as the first speaker of South Africa's Democratic Parliament, which repealed a number of decades old apartheid legislation. She commanded high respect among members of Parliament and the public in her tenure, which spanned the first critical decade of our democracy. Under her leadership, she transformed Parliament from a bastion of colonial and apartheid oppression to a truly democratic and people-centered institution. To date, Parliament continues to unite the nation and heal the wounds of the past by making sure that it passes just laws that are consistent with the Constitution. She was also an internationalist by being one of the powerful and influential revolutionary voices in exile where she had spent three decades. She was key in mobilizing international resistance through multinational cooperation, including the imposition of sanctions against the apartheid regime. Through her links in the Southern African Development Community region and East Africa, she was instrumental in arranging safe passage for Oliver Tambo and other key freedom fighters who left the country to establish the liberation struggle programs in exile. Dr. Janwala also served as a member of the Preparatory Committee for the First World Conference of Presiding Officers. She was previously a board member of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, as well as the former chairperson of the Southern African Development Community Parliamentary Forum. She is a former member of the United Nations Secretary General Advisory Panel of the high-level personalities on African development and served as commissioner of the International Commission on Human Security. In 2005, she was honored with the Order of Utuli in Silver for her excellent contribution to the struggle against gender oppression and her tireless contribution to the struggle for a non-sexist, non-racial, just and democratic South Africa. Dr. Feeney Jinwala is a giant among a special generation of leaders to whom we owe our freedom and to whom we owe our community. Keep holding the sun of the church and the country.
Thank you. Seated. I briefly welcome and thank all of you for being with us this morning and this memorial service convened by His Excellency the President to honor the former Speaker of the National Assembly, Dr. Freddy Genoa. Allow me to begin by recognizing the family of Dr. Genoa, His Excellency our President, President Ramaphosa, his Excellency, our former President, President Mbeki, members of Cabinet present here, as well as other members of the Executive, His Excellency Premier Le Sufi, members of Parliament and leaders of parties represented in Parliament, their Excellencies, Ambassadors and High Commissioners, we're most grateful that they're here, distinguished guests, comrades and friends. We will be sharing co-hosting of the program with my colleague, Honorable Nomantum Komo Ralehoko, the MEC of Health of Gauteng. I shall begin and she will, at the appropriate moment, lead the program. Could I begin by inviting the Honorable Premier of the Gauteng Province, Mr. Pangyaza Lisufi, to present welcome remarks. And can I remind everybody that I was a presiding officer and therefore time is of essence. Premier Lusufi. Thank you so much. Uh, Program Director, Mena Lekipando, and MEC Nko Moralu Huku, His Excellency our President, the family, Comrade Freddy Chinoala, our former President, members of Cabinet, and members of the Provincial Legislature and Provincial Government, in the interest of time, allow me to observe protocol. Today, we are memorializing the life of one of the greatest and inspiring South Africans, an individual whose name is synonymous with some of the highest and most desirable ideals. For us to be free, others had to let go their freedom. For us to achieve our freedom, our others had to forsake their time. For us to crush the racist regime, others have to believe in unracialism. Our path to freedom was led by men and women of great stature. Our path to freedom was paved by those who believed in a vision where South Africans will live together black and white. Our transition to a truly democratic, non-sexist and free South Africa was presided by those who loved our people dearly. As we gather here today, we do so because we lost the lioness of our struggle. As we converge here, we do so because the one who was brave has left us. As we collectively pay our tributes, we do so because we are not ashamed to cherish her. Without any inch of shame and regret, the name Comrade Freeni Noshia Jinwala stands out like a glittering stars at night. It's a name you are ready to honor and salute, not only yesterday, today, or tomorrow, but forever. Our Madam Speaker was made of thinner stuff, polite where politeness was needed, intelligent where intelligence was required, rough when roughness was needed to restore sanity. A woman of formidable, sometimes forbidding intelligent and piercing intelligence, she was regarded as one of the shrewdest brains in the ranks of the African National Congress. 
with a glittering future in academic and law opened to her, she chose to serve our people and work full-time for the ANC in London when she took her first post to establish the Department of Information and Publicity for our movement. A lawyer, an academic, a journalist, and an activist, but above all, a liberator. A role in our struggle, coupled with 30 years she spent in exile, is an affirmation that our struggle was once led by people of impeccable credentials, those who were willing to be led but not demanding to lead at all costs. On behalf of the people of Gauteng, we let go our province to you all so that it can be used to honor this giant of our struggle, a peacemaker. On behalf of the people of Gauteng, we open up everything we possess for you to use it to salute this phenomenon woman of our struggle. To the family and relatives, freedom is not fully achieved, but definitely the foundation is solidly established. Together with you, we'll finish the task, but please find solace that she has not died because the ideals to which she stood for the ideals of non-racialism non 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 and non-sexy South Africa, those ideals will never die. Go well, formidable Frini. Go well, Democrat, feminist, and a true national hero. Go well, our Madam Speaker. I thank you. Thank you very much, Premier Lusufi. A life well lived is not mourned, it is celebrated. And that is what we are here to do today. Included among the tributes that will be paid to Dr. Jinwala today will be musical items, music she loved. Because she loved music, you may not know that side of her. She had a sharp wit, loved music, loved people, loved fun when fun could be had. Indeed, as South Africans, we are so, so fortunate. In fact, so fortunate that often we don't recognize our fortune. We stand on the shoulders of so many giants. The only question we still have to answer is that advantage that those shoulders give us. How are we going to put it to good effect? That is all that we must answer. We don't lack reach. It is just the ambition. So we have the musical item now. I don't know what was selected, but I recall.
thank you very much for that. It's now my privilege to call on Mr. Cyrus Rustamjean, the nephew of the late Dr. Jinwala, to present the obituary. Cyrus? Thank you, Program Director. Good morning, Your Excellency President Ramaphosa, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Obituary of Dr. Freni Noshir Jinwala. Dr. Freni Noshir Jinwala was born on the 25th of April, 1932, in Johannesburg. Her parents were Naswan Jinwala and Miss Banu Bodanwala. And her siblings were Koshed Jinwala Rastamji and Soli Jinwala. In the, 19, in the 1890s, her grandparents emigrated from India to Mozambique and later to South Africa. Education. She attended school in India and later in Fordsburg, Johannesburg. After completing a Bachelor of Laws degree from King's College, University of London in the 1950s, she was admitted as a barrister at the Inner Temple in England. In 1974, she was awarded a Doctor of Philosophy degree at the Lineker College of the University of Oxford for her thesis on the topic, Class, Consciousness and Control, Indian South Africans, 1860 to 1946. Dr. Jinwala had a multifaceted career spanning political activism, law, academia, journalism, and public service. Political activism. As a lifelong member of the African National Congress, ANC, she served in various structures, including the National Executive Committee, NEC, the NEC Subcommittee on Governance and Legislature, the ANC Constitutional Commission, and the Committee for the Retrieval and Deposit of ANC Archives. At the request of Mr. Walter Sisulu, she left South Africa in 1960 to facilitate the escape of Mr. O.R. Tambo to Mozambique. Together with Mr. Tambo, Dr. Jinwala helped to establish the external mission of the ANC in Tanzania. She later headed the political research unit in the office of the then ANC President Tambo and was renowned for her research on South Africa's nuclear program, economic sanctions, and the arms and oil embargoes in particular. She lectured at various universities and institutions in a number of countries, and also participated in various international conferences hosted by the United Nations and other organizations to deal with issues related to conflict research, women, development, and technology transfer. She served as the ANC spokesperson in the United Kingdom and also worked in Tanzania, Zambia, and Mozambique. While in exile in Tanzania in the early 1970s, President Julius Nyerere asked her to establish and edit the Standard newspaper. After more than 30 years in exile, Dr. Jinwala returned to South Africa in 1990. She joined the Secretariat in the office of the then ANC President, Mr. Nelson Mandela. Between 1991 and 1994, she served as the Deputy Head of the ANC Commission for the Emancipation of Women and was the ANC representative on the Science and Technology Initiative. 
As a committed constitutionalist, she played a key role in the multi-party Convention for a Democratic South Africa negotiations that preceded the first democratic elections held in South Africa in 1994. She served as a member of the technical committee responsible for drafting new laws on the elections and the Independent Electoral Commission. First Speaker of the National Assembly. From 1994, she served as the first Speaker of the National Assembly in a democratic South Africa. She led the transformation of Parliament into a democratic people's parliament with a new democratic constitution of the Republic of South Africa of 1996, systems and rules that prioritized openness and transparency, and embraced the voices and participation of all South Africans as equal citizens. As the first speaker of the National Assembly, Dr. Jinwala championed new initiatives, including the Perspectives on and of Africa project, which focused, among other things, on sourcing the oldest images and maps illustrating the African continent. She took great satisfaction from locating the oldest known map of Africa from China, made in 1389, titled De Ming Hunya Tu. A copy of that map was presented to Parliament in 2002. Gender activist. She was unshakable in her steadfast commitment to advance gender equality and advocated the active participation of women in the mainstream economy. She also organized scholarships for destitute youth. She was a founder member and the first national convener of the Women's National Coalition, which brought together South African women from across the political, economic, social, and religious spheres to ensure their participation in the making of the Constitution and in the formulation of the Women's Charter that was launched in 1994. Dr. Jinwala later led the South African parliamentary delegation to the Beijing Women's Conference in 1995. International roles. Her many global roles included serving as a board member of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance as chairperson of the Southern African Development Community Parliamentary Forum, as co-chairperson of the Global Coalition for Africa, and as a member of the UN Secretary General's Advisory Panel of High-Level Personalities on African Development. The International Commission on Human Security and the Advisory Board on Corruption established under the African Union Convention on preventing and combating corruption. She was also a member of the International Women's Commission for the establishment of a just and sustainable peace in Palestine and Israel. In South Africa, Dr. Jinwala chaired the presidential inquiry into the fitness of the then National Director of Public Prosecutions, Advocate Vusi Piccoli, to hold office in 2007-2008, and she was a member of the Ministerial Review Commission on Intelligence. She was a founder member of the Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution in 2010, and also served on the Oliver and Adelaide Tambo Foundation, Nelson Mandela Foundation, and Freedom Park Trust, respectively. Awards and honorary degrees. In 2005, Dr. Jinwala was awarded the Order of Lutuli in Silver for, and I quote, her excellent contribution to the struggle against gender oppression and her tireless contribution to the struggle for a non-sexist, non-racial, just and democratic society. In recognition and acknowledgement of her selfless contribution to various socio-economic and political activities, she received numerous local and international awards and honorary degrees. These included 
the honorary doctor of law degree by the University of the Witwatersrand in 2022, the Pravasi Bharatiya Saman Award by the Government of India in 2012, the Order of the Rising Sun by the Emperor of Japan in 2008, the North-South Prize by the North-South Centre of the Council of Europe in 2003, the Honorary Doctor Technologiae by the then Port Elizabeth Technicon, now M Nelson Mandela University in the year 2003, the Honorary Doctor of Law degree by the University of Connecticut, USA in 2002, the Global Award for Outstanding Contribution for Promotion of Human Rights and Democracy by the Priyadarshini Academy India in the year 2000, the Women of the Year Award by the University of Pretoria Faculty of Law also in the year 2000, the Grand Officier de l'Ordre National of Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire, in 1998, the Honorary Doctor of Law degree by the University of Cape Town in 1997, and the Honorary Doctor of Law degree by Rhodes University in 1996. Dr. Jinwala passed away on the 12th of January 2023 at the age of 90 at, at her home in Johannesburg. She is survived by her nephews Zavare, Cyrus and Saurabh Rastamji and their families. May her soul rest in peace. I thank you. celebration. Thank you very much, uh, Cyrus, an illustrious uh, career indeed. As the program director, I shall direct the program, but I can't resist snippets from our relationship as presiding officers. I recall we were chairing one meeting together, and there was a gentleman in the meeting who referred to himself as Professor so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he was making rather unprofessor-like comments on the subject we were discussing. And uh, Speaker Jinwala turned to him and said, uh, why do you call yourself Professor? You're actually not a Professor. And imagine our laughter when the gentleman turned to Dr. Jinwala and said, well, you call yourself Doctor, but you're not a Doctor not understanding that you can attain a PhD. Allow me to invite tributes in this order from Ambassador Barbara Masichella, who will be followed by former Minister of Transport in President Mandela's government, Mr. Mac Maharaj. So if Ambassador could come up and then uh, former Minister Mac Maharaj will follow. afternoon. We've gathered here to rejoice in the extraordinary, extraordinary life of our comrade, Dr. Frini Koshed Jinwala, Noshir Jinwala, <laughs> our own, one of our own. There have been so many wonderful tributes 
in the newspapers, on radio, on television, are uh, all commenting on the illustrious career and life of Dr. Freni Genuala. It's strange for me to say Dr. Freni Genuala because we just called her Freni. She was Freni to all of us and she never demanded to be called by any titles. Freni was a freedom fighter par excellence. Her dedication to the freedom of the people of South Africa, whom she served through her movement, the African National Congress, places her in the pantheon of a cohort of leaders who have left us a legacy which will live forever. A legacy which we must protect. A legacy which we have to preserve. A legacy which sometimes, more often than not, seems to be in danger of being shattered. Her life of service stretched from her youth till she passed away, which was actually almost over 70 years of service to the people of South Africa. Freni, as you all know, was a feminist of a high caliber who ensured that justice and equality for women was inserted into every fight, into every strategy, into every program in which she participated. She was an internationalist who helped to build the international solidarity movement against apartheid and for the reconstruction of South Africa later on. She traveled to every corner of the earth and worked with progressive leaders the world over. So although we claim her for our own, she also belonged to the world. A scholar of, the constitu of, cons of constitutional law who did not suffer fools and whose forthrightness and her a reputation of courage wherever she went. She was a creative thinker who did not tolerate fluff. She was a sophisticated woman who was always well groomed and remarkably elegant at all occasions. She was an eloquent disciplinarian who was very disciplined in her own life. She was much, much more than all of the things I have mentioned. I met Freni the first time in London but at, she was such a, a strict person and almost aloof at times. And I must say that I didn't like her when I met her because she seemed to know everything. And if you did something, if you worked with her and you did something right, she was very sparing in her praise. And she would praise you and say, that was very good. However, then she would go on a long trip saying the things that you had left out. 
But when we worked in Mr. Nelson Mandela's office, Comrade Mandela, when we asked Freni to join us, we were very wary because whereas Jesse and I had, or Jesse Duarte and myself had already started the office and established it, she was coming in as a researcher and we made sure that nobody knew she was coming because we were afraid that some people would try to stop her joining the office of Mr. Mandela. But she proved to be such a treasure in the office and every Monday, Jesse, myself, uh, and, and Freni and Mr. Mandela had a meeting to review the week past and to plan for the week coming. And sometimes Mr. Mandela placed us in a very difficult position, asking us to tell him the truth about how we felt about some recommendation he wanted to make to, 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 to the NEC or some decision he had to make. And um, if somebody said, um, no, I agree with Barbara, or I, he said, no, I want to know what you think. What do you think? Because sometimes Ifreni was the first one to speak, we had no alternative to agree because she was so smart, you know, so it, it seemed superfluous to say anything more. But she was also, she could also be uh, very playful. And um, in rare moments, but I was watching a video of hers describing how Mr. Mandela escaped from the office one day and then he got stranded in his outing, in his private outing, and then had to call the office and ask us for money to come and save him because he had no money to pay the taxi that brought him back to the office. And this happened on several occasions. Uh, sometimes he would be mobbed in one of his escapes and again he would call the office and it was just a wonderful thing seeing the amusement and, and, and complete relaxed laugh that Freni had when these, when these events uh, happened. Um, we have a very great example to emulate in the life of Freni Genuala. Um, she has achieved so much and she has left us this brilliant legacy which is immeasurable and will always shine a light in the darkness of history. One of the last things that uh, happened between me and Freni is that she was reading a book called The Trial of Cecil Rhodes, of Cecil John Rhodes, and she was just obsessed with it. And she kept on saying to me, you must buy that book. You must read it and you must come back and we must discuss it. And I must say that one of the proudest things for me was that on her table, in her living room, she had all the books that she had read recently. And she had my book there too. And I, I felt so proud and happy that she had she loved my book because I would have, I never got into the discussion because I'm sure I would have had a lot of howevers. We love Freni and we must endeavor 
to emulate her. And I can say that we've had very, very strong and uh, uh, hard arguments with her we had when we worked with her. And I think that was true in every sphere that she participated in. But one thing I can say with confidence that I can shout out on top of the mountain is that Freni had integrity. From the beginning of her life in politics to the very end, whether we agreed with her or not, she was a woman of high integrity. Thank you. Mr. President, former president, leaders of the different formations of our society, members of Comrade Freni's family, I am humbled and honored to be given this opportunity to pay tribute to Comrade Freni Chinwala. Comrade Freni was endowed with many talents which led her to serve as a powerful voice and a formidable figure in a generation of leaders and activists who founded and developed our constitutional democracy. She cut her teeth in the turbulent times that arose in the wake of the Sharpeville massacre and the banning of the ANC and the PAC in 1961. It was a time when the liberation movement was forced into exile. We had to rely especially on the support and goodwill of African states that were about to throw off the yoke of colonialism and grapple with finding pathways to lift their people out of poverty and misery. They were searching for ways forward in a world riven by the Cold War, the Sino-Soviet controversy, and a world in which the non-aligned movement was born. Nelson Mandela has often said that it was the struggle that made him to be the person that he was. I shall therefore dwell on a few events that shaped Comrade Trenny into a resilient and resolute freedom fighter. Few comrades know of the, comrade, of the contribution that Comrade Trenny made with regards to the armed struggle conducted by Umkonto Wesizwe. It is necessary, therefore, to put this information on the record. In 1979, Comrade Freni handed me a bulky lever arch file which contained the layout of the mobile refinery in Durban. I passed the file to Comrade Slovo, who at that time was heading the recently established Special Operations Unit, which was reporting directly to President Tambo. The file provided us with in-depth information, in-depth information on the functioning of an oil refinery, its layout, and its vulnerable points. Attacking the refinery would have been a tremendous blow and would have fitted neatly into stimulating mass struggle within South Africa, as well as the international campaign to impose oil sanctions against apartheid. Comrade Ismail Abu Bakr, better known as Comrade Rashid, came into the country secretly to conduct an on-site reconnaissance of the refinery. He reported back that it would be relatively easy to carry out the attack. 
However, he reported that there was a danger that if the fractionating towers were hit, the resulting vapor cloud explosion could destroy the entire surrounding area. And that would endanger the lives and health of the local Indian and colored communities of Mirbank and Wentworth, as well as the students housed at the Alan Taylor residence at the University of Natal Medical School. Special Ops therefore decided not to proceed with the attack on that refinery. However, they used that information about the mobile refinery in order to plan and successfully attack Sassel 1 and Sassel 2 on the night of 31st of May in the morning of the 1st of June 1980. Comrade Freni was also involved in doing preliminary planning against the power stations and the power network in South Africa. Comrades under her guidance provided special ops with detailed maps plotting the location of the pylon network which was used to good effect by special operations. Comrade Trenny was a formidable organizer who built a network wherever she journeyed in the world. And this enabled her to provide the means for many of our leaders to find their way to safety in Dar es Salaam in the early 60s where the ANC was able to establish its offices, regroup and reorganize itself. In Mozambique, in liberated Mozambique, she provided the ANC with three properties in Maputo which originally belonged to her family. In Dar es Salaam, she edited a newspaper called The Spearhead. She served on the editorial board of the Algeria-based journal Revolution Africaine and worked as a stringer for the Guardian newspaper in London. At the time when newly independent Tanganyika was grappling with the role of the media in the context of the anti-colonial struggles, her editorials in the spearhead promoting a free press brought her into collision course with the government led by President Nyerere. And in 1963, she was deported. Seven years later, the government of Tanzania, Tanganyika, revoked the deportation order and invited her back to Tanzania. And on the 5th of February, 1970, President Nyerere announced that the government had taken control of the foreign-owned newspaper, The Standard, and that he had appointed Comrade Trenny as its managing editor. He also announced that in that job, Comrade Trenny would be directly responsible to the president and the president alone. But in running a, news, a government owned newspaper committed to encouraging debate within the framework of a country striving to build a socialist society that was just, it was destined to generate controversies both within the staff at the standard and within the public arena. One of the expatriate journalists who worked with Comrade Trenny at that time described her, and I'll quote him, as a pinless hand grenade in a sari. Eighteen months later, the Standard carried an editorial condemning Ghaffar Nimeri, the president of Sudan, for the violent purge of members of the Sudanese Communist Party. This stance clashed with the Tanzanian government's drive to build a campaign against the regime of Idi Amin in Uganda. Nemery was one of the few African leaders to support the position taken by the Tanzanian government. Freni was summarily dismissed and ordered out of Tanzania. I relate these incidents to remind us of the difficult circumstances in which the ANC was operating and the turbulent times in which Freni forged her steely resolve to search for the truth and stand for social justice. Despite being deported twice, Freni never painted herself as a victim. In 
In September 2007, our government suspended Advocate Vusi Pakoli from his position as the National Director of Public Prosecutions and appointed a commission of inquiry headed by Comrade Freni Jinwala to determine Pakoli's fitness to hold office. Comrade Freni was meticulous in the conduct of the inquiry and ensured that there was maximum transparency. And she found against the government and ruled that Advocate Pakoli was fit to hold the office of the National Director of Public Prosecutions. Her report brings out her deep commitment to truth and social justice. In her books, our constitution and the interests of the people of South Africa was paramount. She followed a simple rule that what was in the country's interest would be in the interest of the ANC because the ANC has fashioned itself as a voice of the people and an instrument and servant of the people. These three incidents taken together bring out not only her indomitable spirit, but also tell us of Freni, an authentic freedom fighter forged in the furnace of struggle. Hambagasle, Comrade Freni, may your legacy inspire us to soldier on to build the South Africa of our dreams, the South Africa enshrined in the Freedom Charter and in the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, which was signed into as a, being our foundational law at Sharpville by Nelson Mandela on the 10th of December, 1996. Hamba Gathe, Comrade Freni. Uh, thank you very much to Comrade Mac Maharaj, an indomitable uh, woman indeed. I believe we should reflect as well on the international contribution that Comrade Freeney made, including leading the National Assembly from the front on international matters, having served as chair of the Interparliamentary Union, the SADC Parliamentary Forum, the Global Coalition for Africa in various periods, and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association branch in South Africa. She was also, and I remember she loved this role, a former member of the UN Secretary General's advisory panel of high-level personalities on African development. And she served as a commissioner of the International Commission on Human Security, a report that she presented in 2000 outlining how we need to pay attention to the full flood of development uh, areas that we tend not to address when we focus on socioeconomic development. Some may recall the very important role she played in partnership with Minister Dlamini Zuma in crafting the protocol on the Pan-African Parliament. I remember watching this duo confront President Gaddafi and insist on the democratic character of that protocol. So an internationalist par excellence. I now invite tributes from the following and I shall retire from the program directing and hand over to MEC Ngomo Ralihoko after this. I invite Ms. Preg's governor, a human rights activist, not just in our country, but globally. So Preg's, if you are here, you would take the floor, followed by the former speaker of the National Assembly, Comrade Baleka Mbete, who was a very close friend, colleague, and comrade of Frini Genuala. Former speaker will be followed by a member of our parliament and a member of the Pan-African Parliament, Ms. Pemi Majodina, 
who is currently Chief Whip of the Majority Party in the National Assembly. So in that order, if I could ask that the speakers proceed. Is Pregs here? Are you here? Ah, wonderful. Pregs, please proceed. I have to be oh, efficient. <laughs> Thank you. Fanny was uh, very clear about timekeeping. So I made my way up here before I was called. Thank you, dear Fanny. At 90, your heart remained that of the courageous 28-year-old who joined the fight for freedom and helped ensure the safe passage of ANC leaders like Comrade O.R. Tambo. In exile, you refused to be subordinate secretary, taking notes while men spoke. Instead, you, with other powerful ANC feminists, ensured that his speeches and other key documents addressed not just class and race, but gender oppression, and committed to both non-racism and non-sexism. You analyzed the world and acted to change its injustice. You were an internationalist, standing in solidarity with countries fighting for freedom, including Palestine, against Israel's apartheid. The greatest tribute we can pay you today isn't to deify you or put you on a pedestal. You would have hated that and you would have said so you would want us to focus on the policy options captured in your writings for our country to transform the patriarchal, capitalist, apartheid state's spatial geography that still traps millions in brutal poverty. It is no wonder if we want to understand why and who is most vulnerable to gender-based violence Look at the streets which have no lights. Look at the homes that have no toilets. Look at those who have to walk long distances for water. Understand misogyny in public policy. That is what Frenny would have wanted us, would have demanded that we do. After 1994, you presided over a secular democratic parliament that instituted a moment of silence in which, to use Mandela's words, we use the silence to make us understand how precious words are and how real speech is in its impact on the way people live and die." Unquote. In silence, we can overcome our fear. In silence, we can listen to learn to trust our ability to think critically and creatively, and we can learn to trust each other. We can reconnect to the dignity inherent in every single one of us, recognized by our constitution in its first founding, as its first founding value, alongside equality and social justice. Dear friend, you were the visionary who convened the Women's National Coalition in early 1992. In response to South Africa's male-dominated transition, you united 90 national organizations and hundreds of local organizations and regional coalitions across party and other divides. At the end of that year, you'd poached a young coordinator of the Workers' College. Your brief was to help the coalition conceptualize and manage in one year a massive participatory research campaign you dubbed Big Years. The coalition went to rural areas, supporting women in forming regional coalitions and supporting the rural women's protest at Codessa, as well as the coalition's expert teams, legal research and media supporting women negotiators when traditional leaders in conservative parties argued against gender equality. An estimated two million women participated 
and contributed to the Coalition's campaign. Our shared commitment, despite the differences we argued about, and there were a few of those, ensured the campaign secured the necessary political will. The Coalition's Women's Charter demands are reflected in South Africa's final constitution and guided the work of Parliament's Committee on Women. You are a historian, Flenny, who worked to record the role and relevance to the present of black women's powerful challenges to colonialism and economic injustice. Her story, your paper with Macintosh and Massey, or entitled Gender and Economic Policy, should be read by every economist, especially our policy experts, and anyone who wishes to understand the structural causes of gender oppression that increase poverty, precarious employment, unemployment, and patriarchal violence. You wished for, we all wanted, a democracy that ensured substantive equality, justice, democracy, and freedom. After your passing, I listened to a recording of a 2018 conversation the two of us had about Parliament's book series of personal reflections on the constitution-making process. In the recording, we laugh a lot amidst serious reflection, alert to the massive challenges, including persistent class, race, and gender inequality. You are proud of what Parliament achieved, especially the work of Parliament's Committee on Women that you'd initiated and that I'd chaired, that held hearings with rural women and ensured Parliament enacted 80% of women's legislative priorities. We pushed for women's paid and unpaid, unvalued work to be counted by Stats SA. You were particularly animated about the women's budget that the Finance Committee's Working Group on Gender and Macroeconomics initiated with NGOs. In an international speakers forum, and many other spaces, you boasted about the use of the first budget debates to propose the women's budget, helping lead many other countries in this regard. By 2002, my own opposition to government policy on gear, the arms deal and HIV and AIDS that preceded my resignation were not easy for you to publicly align with. Normally, MPs took their leave from the National Assembly and the people of South Africa in a public debate. The ANC whip, whose instruction I'd ignored not to mention HIV and AIDS in the International Women's Day debate, ensured that this opportunity was removed. Yet you addressed my farewell event held in a dining hall outside the National Assembly in your capacity as Speaker of Parliament. I felt your respect, your love, our shared commitment. If there is an afterlife, I hope that you and two other powerful feminist sisters who died in the same fortnight, Petu Siroti and Myrtle Witboy, are dancing, laughing, and celebrating your collective love, courage, and insubordination that you all taught me. Today, I wear a sari to honor you, Freni, you knew the power and the danger of culture in a country in which a brutal apartheid state had co-opted culture to foster narrow parochial ethnicities and nationalisms, racism, misogyny, and xenophobia that fascist leaders and states across the world continue to do today, pitting people against each other instead of addressing the root causes of increasing inequality, poverty, and violence. In 1994, you, a black woman of Indian descent, in apartheid's previously all-male, all-white parliament, stepped into the most powerful position in the house, wearing a sari, reclaiming culture as celebratory as liberatory. In that speaker's chair, you sat solid above me as I shared the country report we'd edited for Beijing to re-include black women in apartheid Bantustans who'd been edited out by apartheid, uh, drafters, apartheid uh, drafters of the initial Beijing draft. For gender-responsive budgets, for abortion against gender-based violence, 
for counting and valuing women's unpaid, unrecognized contribution to society. I felt you beaming quietly your support as I feel it now. Hambagashle, beloved Flenny, your life touched and inspired me. May it inspire future generations to work across generational and other difference towards the world of our dreams. Thank you. family of comrade Jinwala, the Jinwalas and the Rastomjis and other close friends and family who are here. I also recognize her family, the African National Congress, whose president leads the leaders who are here today and the cadres and Amakosigazi, who are here, who have led us in song. <laughs> in celebration of a life well lived. Comrade Fringi Jinwala's trailblazing contribution to the new dispensation in South Africa can only be compared to that of another founder in our history, Mama Charlotte Matrike. Charlotte left a legacy of being a founder towards the establishment of the AME Church of South Africa. She established schools. She mobilized women across racial lines. She was one of the founders of the African National Congress itself, having actually participated in the Vaihu Church on January the 8th, 1912. Charlotte was a leading intellectual of her time, raising critical matters relating especially to the realities of traditional communities and women within them. Her value was respected even by Ubukosi in this respect, where she was called upon 
uh, to the Royal House Yabatembu as an advisor who was respected. Charlotte became a respected voice, uncompromising in engaging the authorities of different levels in different decades. I would even boldly suggest that her example is what inspired the 1956 activism that led to the march to the Union buildings, although she had been gone for a decade and a half already. As the Archives Subcommittee of the African National Congress of the NEC, the outgoing NEC that handed over to the December conference, we have put it on record in our end of term report of 2022 that we marked the 90th birthday of Dr. Frini Jinwala. This is the comrade who must be credited for the attention and the work towards the preservation of the archives of the struggle for our liberation. And I must express my gratitude here and my honor to Comrade Barbara Masikela for the role she played in her consultation and discussion with President Mandela that led to them arranging for Comrade Freeney being relocated from London at the time to join the Secretariat as she has told us this morning. Because had it not been for them doing that, we don't know that Comrade Freeney would have been able to join us because of the attitudes and the things that do happen within the spaces in our interactions, in our daily dynamics, in the struggle and the movement in particular. Attention to President Ramaphosa's October 22 bilateral agreement between the University of Fort Hare and the ANC, whose main focus was in the addendum that the Archives Committee had pursued because of work that Freely had done 30 years before in her being the main advisor and being the supporter as the main researcher whose groundwork and whose record, and in fact, who was credited already in the era of President Oliver Tambo's times with the solid work that Comrade Mac Maharaj told us about today. And that's why they were able to recognize that the fact that she was needed to lead the research aspect of the work in the Secretariat of, uh, uh, Oliver, uh, of Comrade Nelson Mandela in those founding days. And therefore, in that capacity, Comrade Firini had done that earlier work to which the addendum that Comrade President uh, Ramaphosa went and signed in October 2022 an addendum which was upgrading the earlier agreement that had been signed by President Mandela and Professor uh, Bengu at the time, who was representing Fort Hare, and was now including the area of technology because in these days we are talking for IR we're talking about digitization, and therefore it's an era whereby, whereas 30 years before, the archives were paper archives, we are now talking about digitization of the archives, in fact, not only of the ANC, but of the struggle broadly. As I say, in that regard, we must pay attention to the role played by Frini behind the scenes 
when President Mandela, in 1992, signed the first agreement between the African National Congress and the University of Fort Hare, after which the University of Fort Hare has, has since established a National Heritage and Cultural Studies Center, which in fact is now hosting all archives of the liberation struggle of the ANC, but also of all other organizations that participated in the struggle, including the PAC, the ASAPO, the PCM, and other organizations, perhaps where leaders have archives of individual roles that they played as participants in those formations that are outside of the African National Congress. I must hasten to point out that the, the leadership of the generation of President Mandela had quietly led the consultations with all the other parties in their time already in order for all of them to agree to the idea of the need for the records to all be taken to Fort Hare, to the University of Fort Hare, as itself a critical player in the history of South Africa in decades gone by. A history which, in fact, was marked when it finished its own centenary uh, a little while ago. Through the NEC subcommittee and Freeney's careful forward-looking planning, she ensured that archivists were sent for training, some of whom today are at the Nelson Mandela Foundation doing this valuable work. She told me when we were interacting with her in this past year around the issues of her birthday celebration that she had taken her own personal papers to the Nelson Mandela Foundation where she knows that some of these people that she had seen to the training of were now working and were going to be looking meticulously after the documents that had been generated in her own work. She had also brought back to HQ, ANC head office, to the archives unit headed by the manager, Comrade Zolile Mvunelo, whom she left there. Uh, she took boxes of what documents she thought properly belonged to the ANC. So, Comrade Frini was a very organized person, very, very meticulous about what is done, how you plan ahead to make sure that there's no confusion ahead of time, and rather than just leave things to chance and hope that somebody is going to find a way of sorting things out. So she also had asked me uh, and told me recently about the book about uh, the trial of Cecil John Rhodes because she also had ideas about, together with other researchers that she continued contact with, uh, how to relate the approach in the trials of Cecil John Rhodes to our South African historical uh, reality and perhaps learn from that. In the three occasions we spent time with Frini last year, including the beautiful celebration of her birthday, regrettably it was not possible to give her a proper briefing on the latest developments relating to the work she started so meticulously as the first chair of the Archives Committee. Suffice it to say, to summarize it this way, the work of the Archives Subcommittee had subsequently led to the formation of what is now a non-partisan body, which is a collaboration of those who participated in the liberation struggle, 
whose archives are at Fort Hill. The legal framework to ensure proper guidance of this work is under consideration and is at uh, initial stages of discussion. And we are hoping that with the involvement of the legal unit of the ANC at headquarters, there's going to be more clarity on what best to be done in this regard. In the speech of the Uni uh, University of Fort Hare Vice Chancellor Bushungu on the occasion of the October signing ceremony with the president of the ANC, uh, Comrade Cyril Ramaphosa, the vice chancellor specified that the National Liberation Heritage Institute of South Africa, NALISA, is where we must look to focus on future work in this regard. We continue to be seized with this work with the involvement of the ANC legal unit. In a memo I had to prepare addressed to the president of the ANC in December. Comrade President, I hope you, you've read that memo. I know there are always details that happen in offices and you end up not seeing what is actually addressed to you. In a memo addressed to the president, details are outlined on the digital archive because the digital archive became a focus both in the comments of the vice chancellor but also in relation to reports and other documents that refer to that archive and this archive is work that has been done over many years under comrade Frini Chinwala's uh, leadership and therefore the ANC and NALISA must keep an eye on this area. This would honor Comrade Freeney's hard work. And in this respect, I wish to mention that we have started as NALISA discussions with the Minister, Minister of Higher Education of the continuing training of archivists to ensure that we continue to have the capacity to look after the records about the liberation heritage of our people. Because this is what Comrade Freeney worked hard on. Fuller appreciation of Freeney's wide-ranging contributions to our democracy is something we should do in further engagements, more in-depth work, especially on the first decade after the first elections when she led us as the founding speaker. I intend making a recommendation to the current speaker, my friend who is here, whom I haven't talked to about this matter. I believe collaborations between Parliament, the Charlotte Matlega Institute, and the SAWID, the South African uh, Women in Dialogue Networks, whose, whose memorial I attended, I participated in, would be very good to pursue the work which will do justice to us all in this regard because the value of Comrade Freeney's contributions cannot be done today in today's program or even in the program of SAWIT or the program uh, of the cremation service and other services uh, that are still going to happen. So in order to honor the contribution she made, we need to collaborate and think 
deeper about what we need to do to fully appreciate and bring out for uh, the good of future generations what Frini left through her contributions. Malibongwe. Ikamalika Comrade Frini. Thank you, Comrade. Kutiwa mandizo kwela ingo koko Kwilizwe kazi le Afrika Ate walandulela ekubeni libene paramende Bo mama be Afrika ta Mama, be Africa, Tanda Sela, Maibu. Excellency, the President of the Republic of South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa, the former President Tata Uzizi, Honorable Utabo Mbegi, members of cabinet, members of parties that are here, leaders of parties, leading various parties, allow me to stand on the existing protocols and say all protocol is observed. My greetings to the family. I stand before you in this sober gathering today to join you in conveying the heartfelt condolences of the President of the Pan-African Parliament, Honorable Chief Fortune Zifania Charumbira and the Bureau of Pan-African Parliament, who could not be here with us today owing to pressing commitments as well as entire membership of Pan-African Parliament to the family of the late comrade Dr. Frini Chinwala as well as his party. We are here to pay the tribute to this towering sleeping giant, a woman of substance. For the Pan-African Parliament, passing on of Dr. Chinwala is indeed a somber occasion wherein we are struggling to come to terms with the loss of a giant in African politics, a stalwart of the struggle for independence from apartheid and a champion in found, uh, and a founding member of the Pan-African Parliament. Amidst the grief that grips our very souls and the anguish that wrecks our heart, we remain grateful to the Almighty for the gift of Dr. Chinwale, 
of Dr. Jinwara's very extensive uh, existence of 90 years of a life well lived in service of the people of South Africa and the African continent at large. We are Fukama Ipen African Parliament, Yate Yapuma, Efukuini, Kobabu Shushubake. It is only now that the full import of the renowned scientist Isaac Newton's words has dawned on us as Pan-African Parliament with the full gravity of their, of their profundity. It is Newton who said, I quote, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giant Strauss coat. Indeed, the Pan-African Parliament that we all see today would not have been possible without unwavering commitment and just determination of Dr. Dinoale, who was one of the prime movers behind the formation of the Pan-African Parliament. An unassuming and yet unapologetic Pan-Africanist Pan who firmly believed in representative democracy, the late Dr. Chinwale played an instrumental role in the establishment of the Pan-African Parliament as both member as well as the chairperson of a steering committee that spearheaded the formation of Pan-African Parliament in 2004 and the drafting of the protocol to the treaty establishing the economic community relating to, to the Pan-African Parliament. We thus owe our very existence to unsung luminaries such as Dr. Chinwale, who sacrificed their time in setting up an institution that would guarantee a full participation of African people in the economic development and integration of the continent, speaking in one voice for one Africa. Today, it is a sobering reminder to all of us as Pan-African Parliament of the conviction that those before us had in the importance of the continental parliament within the continental governance framework. The memory of Dr. Chinwale must therefore inspire us to remain firmly focused on the hopes, ideas and aspiration of the African people and what we can and should not do to improve the lives of and the livelihood of our people across the continent. We must not ask what the continent can do for me, but what is that we can do together in our continent. Dr. Chinwale left us at a time when Pan-African Parliament is moving towards a right direction in a positive way. Your goal of rotational leadership has been achieved. We elected the president based on the rotational principle in June 2022. In the face of the numerous challenges that confront the continent, we must be compelled by the force of Dr. Ginoale's exemplary life of selfless service and her unshakable belief in the value of the Pan-African Parliament to ask you not what the continent can do for us, but what we can do for our continent. Her contribution to establishment of a continental representative institution is an indelible legacy which you must uphold by pulling out all stops to ensure that the Pan-African Parliament effectively plays its role in the continental development agenda. How she dressed. She inspired all of us. Those beautiful saris, so spoken lady. For the Pan-African Parliament, you remain with the middle name of Madam Speaker. May yours departed soul, rest in peace and rise in glory. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Amanda. Viva the spirits come on free niche nwala viva. You are you are forcing me to do that comrades in that corner now. You are reminding me by the way who is this mama? Es menga aya namhlanje. Mr President, Babusile Ramaphosa and Babu Mpeki, our former president, all the cabinet ministers that are here, deputy ministers, MECs, the leadership from the various organizations, including my organization, that is Black, Green and Gold, all the distinguished guests, without forgetting our family that is here today, both families, Zgamama, that are here. We are with you in your loss. Mr. President and the leadership that is here, today we are honoring a veteran who was totally against discrimination and that encompasses the texture of life of black people in general and Africans in particular in the country of their birth. She was a veteran who took a conscious decision to be a part of many of our veterans who dedicated their lives to fight for justice and equality in our country. And she was driven by a firm conviction that every person has the capacity to do good, to see sense, to make a meaningful contribution in our society. And in her memory, we must propel us to confront, as we would have, the difficult choices that we need to make to turn around for the better. I am going to introduce to you now Mama Usiswetu Susnosivwe Mapisa Ngakula, our speaker at the National Assembly. But we are going to take one song from our choir and then she will come and talk to us. Thank you so much. Over to you, choir.
Amen. 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 <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I can assure you, it's not always pleasant when you take the podium and you are not speaking in the name of your party, but rather speaking now as a presiding officer, honorable members. <laughs> Mr. President and your cabinet, leaders of political parties who are here this afternoon, Former President Mbeki, former speaker, and we noted the orders you gave us as you were standing here, and all members, members of the Diplomatic Corps, we've noted a number who are here in our midst, family of Comrade Free. And thank you for allowing your daughter, your sister, your aunt, your mommy to be away from you. I do want to request all of us, it's just four lines of this song which I want. It's not a freedom song. I'm inviting all of you. I will tell you why later. Shall we all rise and sing? Raise the flag of freedom on the hills and valleys. Go. On the 9th of May, 1994, those of us who were elected to serve as members of the first democratic parliament entered the National Assembly Chamber in Parliament in Cape Town for the first time as public representatives. It was indeed a moment of celebration, but it was also one filled with the greatest anticipation, tension, and anxiety for our nation as the first small seedlings of our democracy started to break from the ground. The ushering of democracy in our country was quite the uncharted territory. For us as leaders, for our people, and for the world, there had never been a democratic government before, let alone one led by a majority of Africans, and there were many in our country who held their breath, wondering whether the miracle would actually work. As I got down to the actual business of Parliament, as we got down to, to the actual business of Parliament, after our swearing in, the first task was that of electing the leader of the National Assembly in Parliament, the Speaker. Now, that process doesn't start in Parliament. It always starts in a caucus. It was a very interesting caucus. And I hope those of you who are writing the story, the history of South Africa, will note the developments in that caucus. Because, Mr. President, even as we were going to Parliament, it was unexpected that Parliament would elect a speaker who is a woman. Caucus was so divided. 
we all thought we had the speaker called Frini. And one, two, three, we saw some um, waving and somebody was raising a name of a male comrade. That's the story of the lives of women and that is the story of the struggle of the people of South Africa. But guess what? That lady there in a blue hat with the likes of Tenjiwe and even those who were not members of parliament who had decided to sneak into the chamber because we knew that the agenda was to make sure that we will have this black president called Madiba but we will equally have a speaker who is a woman and that woman was Freni Chinwal. I want this noted, Malik. You must write about it because our children don't know about it. And I think some of us are not aware that this is the dynamic which occurred amongst ourselves as senior members. We're all coming from the NEC, by the way. Mm -hmm. Note that. Now, in many ways, the ascendance of Dr. Freni Chinwala as she walked across the floor to take up her seat as founding speaker of the National Assembly of that day. It had the amazing coming effect on the millions of our people that our democracy had firmly taken root and that we had created a system and that system will succeed. Today, however, we gather here to pay our last respect to her not just as our beloved first speaker of the National Assembly in, de in a democracy, but a great South African, an icon of our movement, a true patriot, and an uncompromising crusader for justice. Like many other leaders who championed our struggle for freedom and democracy, Comrade Frini, her true contribution remains pretty much unknown, even by generations within the circles of her own revolutionary movement, the ANC today. Yes, many in our country know her as the celebrated first speaker of our democratic parliament, but her role in the struggle for the liberation of our people and our country makes her much more than that. And I think that that's where I have a problem. Mr. President, at times. Everybody I've heard speaking, many I've heard speaking, they identify the role of Comrade Freeney as the first speaker. First speaker, true, it's an honor. But the writing of the history of South Africa, the actual fighting for the liberation of the people of South Africa, that's where Comrade Freeney was. And thank you, Sister Papa, for reminding us. Thank you, Prex, and thank you, Comrade Mac, for reminding us that she was just not wearing a sari. She was an underground worker of the African National Congress. Comrade Frini was a committed and an unwavering champion for women's emancipation. It is, in fact, this part of her work that I want to talk to to a greater extent. As we remember her life, we must remember a conference I can never forget, the 1991 conference in Durban. President TM and President Ramaphosa, you know what happened there. The women of South Africa took the floor for the first time because at the Kabwe conference in 1985, the issue was about opening doors for, to, for the ANC in its leadership to be truly non-racial. But at the conference in 1991, the women had decided that it cannot just be non-racial. That leadership has to have women in it. And Comrade Frini, Comrade Barbara, were amongst Comrade Balego, were amongst the women who took the floor and said, we are demanding that women should form part of the National Executive Committee of the ANC. And that at the time, we asked for 30%. At 
And women today in the country should know this history and appreciate that there are women who fought for us to be where we are today. Comrade Frini is one of those who said we want no less than 30%. We lost the battle. We lost the battle. It's okay. But what was interesting is that following that, all women of the African National Congress at the time were called 30%. Today, we have 50% women. Now, Comrade Frini assisted members, leaders of the African National Congress, leaders of the OR himself, was ushered out of the country by Comrade Frini. And this is one of the things we should never forget about the role played by all racial groups in the struggle for liberation of this country. I'm raising this, Mr. President, having noted a speaker that as we come out of conference, the non-racialism of our leadership has gone down. We fought very hard to ensure that the ANC has leadership, which is non-racial. What needs to be said about that particular period of assisting leaders to leave the country by Comrade Frini is that the majority of those men were banned and therefore were driven into the underground. The ANC depended largely on the organizational skills of women activists to keep organizations' political work going on. And, and I'm happy that the former speaker, Mbete, raised this matter very sharply and actually looked at Matrike and the role she played and compared her to Comrade Frini. The other day, when Comrade Frini passed on, I was thinking hard about some of the words uttered by Comrade Jesse before she passed on. Non-racial character of our society. Non-sexism in our society. Non-racism in our society. It was a period during which many women activists, mobilized by the intensification of popular uprising and organization of women in the 50s, came forward, not only to strengthen the women's movement, but also carried tasks of organizing for the ANC and support its underground activities, as was related by Comrade Mac. Those maps would not have been there if Comrade Frini had not drawn those maps. Women were very good in the ANC in reconnaissance, and this is a fact that we should never forget. Women were very good in collecting, gathering intelligence, and Comrade Frini was one among such women. It was in the execution of the task of being travel agents. Women were travel agents. Comrade Frini today, I want to refer to her as a travel agent for expatriating our comrades into exile. And it was the execution of this task that she got involved in assisting OR. He helped comrades to settle in Mozambique, in Tanzania, in Angola. It was her unique organization skills and a particular level of professionalism that led to her establishing comrade OR's office in exile and managing its administration. Comrade Frini knew that despite the huge role and contribution 
the women have made in the life of the ANC and the course of our struggle, even before the 1950s, they had not been recognized as being equal both in society and within the movement she was part of. It was for this reason that as part of her work was in building the ANC was to make sure that women are in all structures at all levels. She was a champion in the struggle against gender inequality and patriarchy. My first encounter with Comrade Frini was at the UN Decade for Women Conference in 1985 in Nairobi. It was at this conference that also debated whether women's emancipation struggle in South Africa is best served as part of the general struggle against apartheid or as a separate movement complementing the struggle against national oppression. Comrade Freeman was part of leading such debates. Because yeah, you had an international conference, you had people from home, but actually the real purpose, the actual discussion takes place on the sidelines where you discuss what next for South Africa. My very first impression of her, she was a, she was a very strong, forceful, passionate campaigner for her beliefs. She could stand up, she could stand up in any meeting. Uh, I hate to say, to use the term, but she could also be very erratic and you'd go back and think about what she has said and reflect on it and later run back to her and she would repeat exactly what she had said but maybe in a better um, crafted manner. And we liked that. She was deeply honest. Deeply, and, and, and unfortunately it is the honesty which not not many of us accept it. Not many of us are receptive to negative feedback. Comrade Freeney could give you that and you'd take it or leave it or walk away, but she will repeat exactly that the following day. Now, as part of the women's section of the ANC, Comrade Freeney, I'm never sure really, comrades, whether Comrade Trina was a member of the ANC Women's Section or the ANC Women's League, whatever it is we call it. But one thing I know is that she was very quick to summon you and say, I hear you were doing A, B, C, D, and E. Can you tell me what was the purpose? And if there's no clarity, you were not providing absolute clarity and answers to what she wanted to hear. Comrade Freeney would quickly dismiss you and later will call you in at how I expected better than that from you. That's Comrade Freeney. And I think it's something which many of us taught us what is called self-introspection and allowing for other people to give you a feedback about yourself. She, she, she was not one to abide by limitations of structure or protocols. Given her proximity to the leadership at the highest level, she had been willing and very ready to try to persuade them about the case of women to a point of admonishing them about the lip service the movement paid to that issue. She managed to rise and played a prominent role in the leadership of the ANC despite obvious gender barriers at the time. She was a capable researcher, people have said, communicator and journalist. Sis Barbara said, and so true, Comrade Frini could, could say, you, you've done very well. I think the match you organized was, was very good. However, I think what ABC do should have happened. I recall when the women were marching at the Trade Center to allow Comrade uh, President 
to allow us to be part of the negotiations process, which led to comrades like Malega and others joining your team. Comrade Frini was part of the women who were leading that much, and we were all demanding that women must be at the negotiations table. So that we became part of at the negotiation, we formed part of the delegations, we all need to know. It is true the hard work of Comrade Frini, the likes of Comrade Frini, the likes of Comrade Barbara Masekela, that we ended, Masisulu, that we ended there. Now, Comrade Frini, I always tell people, yes, she was a speaker. And Comrade Frini earned the respect of political parties. No one imposed Comrade Frini on the people of South Africa. But the moment Comrade Frini came in, into the position of speaker. Comrade Frini conducted her business with absolute integrity and earned the respect of all parties. Of course, we will always differ. We come from different political parties. We have different agendas. We are, and our, some of the, the existence of some of the parties is that of coming up with criticism all the time without providing solutions. And it happens, and that's what used to happen. But Comrade Frini, as all of that was happening, had earned the respect of all those who were in parliament at the time across political divide. People have talked about the National Women's Coalition, which she led, but I do want people to take note of the fact that one of the reasons why we have a constitution which has a Bill of Rights, whose Bill of Rights contain some elements of what came out of that Women's Charter which was developed by the coalition. It is because of Comrade Freeney. It is Comrade Freeney, Comrade Prex. And I'm raised that you are here to speak about those issues. Comrade Freeney. So when you look at the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, you look at the Bill of Rights, look at some aspects of the people, because Comrade Freeney was a fierce, advocate for justice and in particular justice for women now program director we have one of the most proud track record as a country that which has trusted women leadership at the helm of parliament following from the legacy of capacity of women showed by Dr. Jinwana. When she took that mantle of being the founding speaker of the National Assembly, Comrade Balega as her deputy, and Comrade Naledi behind me here, as the chair of the National Council of Provinces, they worked closely to, they were a formidable team. They were a formidable team. If those women and many others who followed them had not done well in those roles, it could have done much damage for the confidence of our people in our country, showed in women leaders, and for future prospects of women leadership. So we appreciate that some of us are where we are today because the likes of Frini paved the way for us. We preside over a very complicated system of rules, procedures, and a dynamic organization which carries not only a chance for the aspirations of our people, but all the hopes for our democracy. 
our institution of the legislature, despite its own challenges, now functions. And it functions because we had Prini Chinwala at the helm, right at the beginning of a democratic parliament. At the time when she, Naledi, and Baleka, and others were handed the task to lead the legislature for the first time, they found nothing, literally nothing. And I want to quote what Comrade Frini says about this. In her own words, she says, and I quote, we started that parliament with a blank sheet. There was no traditions and no precedence as far as the ANC was concerned. So she looked at everything from her eye of a, as a researcher and as a person who was coming from this democratic organization, the liberation movement at the time. And she says, there was nothing because there had been no democracy. And if you don't have democracy, then you don't have a parliament. And I close quote, that's what Comrade Frini said. So we owe a lot to Dr. Chinwala. Yet she never stopped to be passionate about us, her country, and her people. I want to thank Dr. Maluka. Don't know now whether you're a doctor or professor. Professor, professor? Maluka. Baleka and Frini's family for organizing that small, intimate birthday celebration last year for Comrade Frini. But if I may share this with you, Mr. President, since the 2nd of January last year, after the fire, Comrade Frini was sitting on my neck one, she wanted to visit the site, she wanted to see parliament. Secondly, she wanted her historical maps, which were given to them by the Chinese. So she kept on sending the Madam Speaker that site. So whenever Baleka picked up the phone, it always had to do with, when we are near Kufini, Kufini wants those maps, where are they? Where are the maps? And to be honest, we had no clue where the maps were. But what makes me happy now, and I know she's at peace wherever she is, is that just a month around the birthday time, yes, I spoke to Comrade Frini to reassure her that Comrade Frini, we have your maps. We have found your maps. One of your maps is in the office of the speaker, and the other map is in the dining hall. So I can assure you, your maps are safe. And she was very happy. But then the next question was, but when are you bringing me to parliament? And colleagues, we were not ready to take Comrade Freeney to parliament and traumatize her. Because I think it would have been very traumatic to allow Comrade Freeney to visit a dilapidated structure such as parliament and not see where her office was at the time. So, I don't know, I would hope that, Comrade Frini, wherever you are, you are at peace that you know that the maps from China are there, that you know, unfortunately, we could not take you. I think Baleka was negotiating with Maloka every day, just trying to convince her, Ukuti, you can't go to parliament, but she didn't understand that. So we were now planning to invite her for the State of the Nation this year. How she was going to react when she sees that building, I don't know. So as we celebrate her life, let's also remember our own service to those who served us. To take care of our heroes, heroines and stalwarts, to honor them and entrench both their names and deeds in the memory of generations to come. Honorable uh, Steinhazen, I thought I was going to see the Honorable Tony Leon here. I looked, actually, I looked for him 
You know why? Because there was um, Trini and Tony had a love-hate relationship. But a relationship which was informed by by respect. Tony, Honorable Leon, respected Honorable Frini, Dr. Jinwala, the speaker, to the end. And, I would have, and I'm sorry that Ndade Buteles is also not here. I'm hoping that this has been uh, live so that Ndade uh, Buteles too can form part. These are people who really respected Komit Frini because she had earned that respect. So let us celebrate Komit Frini's life. Let us be proud and be grateful for her sacrifices. She departs of us as a great South African icon. And may her beautiful soul rest in peace. Thank you. My apology, Madam Speaker. Amanda Malibongwe Watinta Bafazi Nyakolisa Kulu, Madam Speaker. I know that Punzi Mopagamanzo Susawen. But I had to because of his cash and business cut. Cecilia Pella is cut, said to an Babu president who will be leaving soon. So we will want him to speak to us before he leaves. My sincere apology to everyone. Now, colleagues, can you allow me to call His Excellency President of the Republic of South Africa? Mr. Cyril Matamela Ramaphosa, the President of the African National Congress, to come and speak to the family, Kamamu Frini Chinwala. still program directors, members of the Jinwala family, the Speaker of the National Assembly, former Speaker of the National Assembly, Sis Vale Gambete, the Premier of Gauteng, Panyaza Lusufi, former President Thabo Mbeki, ministers and deputy ministers, religious leaders who are here present and traditional, as well as community leaders, members of the judiciary who are also here present, members of the diplomatic corps, leaders and stalwarts 
of the African National Congress and leaders of other political parties here present, and comrades and friends and fellow mourners. We gather here as friends, family, colleagues, comrades, fellow workers of Comrade Freely Jinwala to celebrate and to pay tribute to her profound contribution to the cause of freedom, peace and progress not only in our country but across our continent as well. We remember a life that was as rich in experience as it was rich in meaning. Comrade Freeni Jinwala played many parts and many of those have been so eloquently explained here this morning. She was a journalist, a lawyer, an author, a researcher, an academic, and a parliamentarian. But she was also an activist, a feminist, a pan-Africanist, and also an internationalist. Yet no roll call of her many achievements can adequately describe the person that she was, nor the impact that she has made in the course of her entire life. Yes, 70 years she devoted and committed to serving her beloved country and her continent. It is telling that amongst her earlier political assignments, she was called upon to find ways for ANC leaders to clandestinely leave the country, a role that the Speaker of our National Assembly has dubbed a travel agent. And I guess if we ever have had a travel agent of note, none has ever been able to excel beyond what she did. Anybody who paved the path for O.R. Tambo must be regarded as the very best, best travel agent in the world. At a time of great uncertainty and danger, she established roots and identified means of passage where before there had been none. Through ingenuity, through courage, yes, I would agree that through inbuilt female ingenuity, through determination and diligence, she forged new paths. Throughout her life, Comrade Freeni Jinwala has been a pioneer, a pathfinder, a leader in the true sense of the word. She was instrumental in setting up the ANC's first office in exile, as we have heard, in which O.R. Tambo worked, establishing the base from which over the coming decades organization would forge what was probably the most powerful international solidarity network and movement of our time. For three decades, she was a vital part of that movement, whether in Tanzania, as we have heard earlier from Comrade Mek Maharaj, whether she was being deported, thrown out, brought in. She did excellently well in other vital parts of our continent in Zambia, Mozambique, 
the United Kingdom and wherever else her assignments took her. On whatever platform given, whatever opportunity, Comrade Fini Jinwala was an eloquent, persuasive champion of the cause of the South African people. She could have stayed as a barrister in the inner temple in London, but she chose to heed the call to come and make a contribution for the struggle for freedom in our country. With her keen intellect, her measured delivery, and her clear articulation of the principles and the purpose of our struggle, she felled many a critic and earned many a friend. Through her writings, whether as a journalist, as a researcher, or an academic, or an activist, she provided both incisive critiques and clear vision. Whether she was in Comrade O.R. Tambo's office or Comrade Madiba's office, this was her given role. She told us what was wrong with the world and most importantly, how it could be made better. Comrade Friini will be remembered as a pioneer of women's rights, as we have heard all morning today at a time when scant attention was given to the many ways in which women were oppressed and exploited, Comrade Freeney fought for the struggles of women to be recognized. Yes, in 1991, she was in the lead with Comrade Baleka and Nosiviwe and others to insist that the ANC National Conference, the 48th Conference, should elect up to 30% of women in its leadership core. Comrade Nosiviwe, you did not win that battle, but I'm able to stand here and say the women of our country as represented in the ANC, have won the war. So you lost that battle, but you won the war. And that war, that war was instigated, yes, by Comrade Freeney and others, but it had the firm commitment of Comrade Oliver Reginald Tambo, who wanted to see the empowerment of women in the ANC. In a political environment in which the dominance of men didn't even invite comment, Comrade Frini Jinwala was one of the few voices that was always consistent and insistent that women should occupy their rightful pos position in the struggle. In this, she can be counted as part of a proud lineage of courageous women that have fought for the freedom of all in this country. And women, black and white, who have led this struggle. Comrade Baleka, you put her on the same level as Uma Mushalot Makleke. How right that is. She can be counted among the ranks of those women who burnt their passes in Bloemfontein in 1913, and amongst the women who marched on the Union buildings in 1956. She can be counted amongst the women who joined the ranks of Umkonte Wesizwe, particularly in the aftermath of the 76 uprising and those who marched on Parliament in 2019 to call for an end to the murder of women of our country by men. 
Freni Jinwala was prominent among those within the liberation movement who were instrumental in crafting a vision for a democratic South Africa that was both non-racial and non-sexist. After a difficult and protracted struggle, she was among those who won broad acceptance for the idea that no country can be free for as long as its women are not free. Having won the principle of non-sexism, Comrade Freeni Jinwala was among those who were determined to give effect to it. It is therefore not surprising that after a return to South Africa, Comrade Freeni formed part of the task force to establish the ANC's Women's League in the country. She helped to set up and become the convener of the Women's National Coalition, which brought together women from all walks of life across the political spectrum to draw a women's charter. This formation played indeed a critical role in ensuring that the rights of women yes indeed did receive proper attention in the negotiations process and were enshrined in the new constitutional order. Comrade Balega, when you became a prominent player together with Comrade Freeney in the negotiations process, we were not surprised. We knew that you and Comrade Freeney and many others had been the real engines to ensure that women are properly represented in those negotiations. And we are pleased that the African National Congress acceded to that. And today we have the most advanced constitution which respects the rights of women, upholds them and protects them, as Comrade Prex Governor was also saying. So thank you for all the efforts that you made. We are where we are today because of the dedication and the work that you and Comrade Freeney and others played a key role in. Of course, no one can forget the role that Comrade Freeney, Comrade Barbara Masekela, and our beloved departed, Comrade Jesse Duarte played in the presidency. They were the triumvirate that truly ran President Nelson Mandela's presidency. You could not get anything past these three outstanding women and get Comrade Madiba to agree if he had not passed it through the three. So they were the three musketeers who really ran that office. And did they run the office well? I would say yes, they did. And some of us who worked closely with Comrade Madiba and Comrade Tabo Mbeki, will probably attest to this, knew that even as we put proposals to Comrade Madiba, he would stress test them with the three musketeers. And Comrade Freeney was amongst those. So this is a real tribute to the role that was played by Comrade Freeney. And today I would also want to pay tribute to Comrade Jesse Duarte. And indeed to pay tribute to Comrade Barbara Masekila. The three of them made President Mandela's office really effective and come alive. As we bid farewell to Comrade Freeney Jinwala, we must recognize that this struggle for equal rights and opportunities for women is far from one. As a society, as a state, and as a movement, 
we have to give full effect to the principles of non-sexism and gender equality. Despite significant progress, women are still underrepresented in positions of authority, responsibility and influence across nearly all areas of public life. And despite the progressive policies that we have pursued since the advent of our democracy, women are still overrepresented amongst the poor, the unemployed, and the vulnerable. The face of poverty is still worn by the women of our country. As Comrade Freeney would remind us, until we have achieved equality between men and women in all spheres of life, we will not be free. We will remember Comrade Freeney as a pioneer in building our democracy from the ruins of apartheid. And it is quite informative to hear our current speaker say, and quoting Comrade Freeney as saying that when she got into office as a speaker, she found nothing. There was nothing that could guide her in putting a new parliament together. Because you could not take a leaf from a system of apartheid to build the future democratic parliament. As part of the ANC's negotiating team, she brought all her legal training, her sharp and incisive mind, and a political conviction to the task of forging a new constitutional order in our country. Yet it was in her role as the first speaker of a democratically elected National Assembly that Comrade Freeney had the greatest and the most enduring impact on our young democracy. Over the course of a decade in that position, she forged a new institution that reflected the great diversity the struggles, the aspirations, the culture, and the practices of the people of South Africa. With her warm and deliberate determination, she forged an institution that stands at the center of our democracy. It is an institution that continues to this day to fulfill its constitutional purpose as the representative the voice and the champion and the instrument of the people of our country. She performed her role as speaker with diligence, with fairness, and with great integrity. She was always mindful that it was her responsibility to serve the people of our country and to do everything within her means to advance their cause. Freeni Jinwala lived, fought, and strived as we all should, selflessly, honestly, courageously, driven by a deep and abiding love of humanity, and more importantly, the people of South Africa. She stood for a South Africa that was united in its diversity. She cherished a society where all may embrace and celebrate their many identities, their many cultures, their many languages, and their different faiths. She stood firm against the abuse of power and corruption. She stood firm against racism, sexism, and all forms of intolerance and prejudice. She stood for human rights for all and indeed for the rule of law. To defend the aspirations of our constitution, 
is to honor the memory of Frini Jinwala, to lead lives of integrity, whether as citizens or leaders, is to uphold her legacy. Good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. These are the tenets of the faith that she was born into. She lived by those, her life embodied those tenets. To her family, especially her beloved nephews, Zev, Cyrus, Sorab, we share in your sorrow. May you be comforted by the knowledge that Comrade Freeney's spirit, her courage, her wisdom, and her generosity will forever be remembered. As we came into this hall, I had occasion to also meet four other people who cared for Comrade Freeney, who must also be thanked for the work that they did over a period of 10 to 15 years. There's Grant Zulu, there's Patience Nguame, there's Ditonia Ndabana, and there's Joey Yende. These are the four individuals who also, together with her family, stood by Comrade Freeney until the end of her life and cared for her. So let us thank them and applaud them as well. I want to end by a reference to something that I found out about Comrade Frini, her love for maps. She got excited once she had discovered or found these maps of our continent and we shared a common passion about maps and we got into an animated discussion about what she had found being the map of Africa that was crafted in 1389 as it is said in the obituary titled Deming Huni Du and we got into a very long discussion about how those maps finally fueled China's great ambition to become a global player, even at that time, when Emperor Judi of the time got Zheng He to lead a, the biggest flotilla of ships ever amassed in the world to set off from China to go to various parts of the world and it is also said that it was during this period that the Chinese were the ones who discovered America whilst we are told that Christopher Columbus was but the important part is that it was this flotilla that came to Africa it came to the eastern seaboard of our continent and historians find today record that the trade between Africa and China started. It was due to these maps that the Chinese launched their most historic global policy and reached out to many parts of the world. Having done a very interesting study of how Emperor Judi and Zheng He went around the world, it was quite an exciting conversation that I had with Comrade Frini about these maps. And I'm glad, Honorable Speaker, that the maps have been preserved because in the preservation of these maps of our continent, Comrade Frini's memory is also preserved. I want to finally say, Comrade Freeney, go well. 
If we ever had Mbogoto, you are the Mbogoto that we really had. And I do want to say, Lalagahle, Madam Speaker, go well and greet those that you will meet, those who are pioneers like yourself, for Charlotte Maklerke and many others. Greet them for us and tell them that we continue with the struggle to make the lives of our people better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, comrades. Amanda. Thank you, comrades. Amanda. We thank uh, we thank the president. Siawong amakaban. Kelebuch nishale ni bambi. Thank you. I know we thank the president for his address and before I invite members of Comrade Trini's family to pay a tribute, I wish to sincerely apologize to the Speaker of the National Assembly, Speaker Mapisa Ngakula, who I committed the cardinal error of leaving out from my list of protocol. Madam Speaker, I hope you'll forgive me for a diplomat's cardinal error and that you won't cut my time in the National Assembly. I do apologize. I now invite Comrade Zav Rastamji and Comrade Godridge Rastamji. I called them both comrades because one was not called a comrade when we had uh, the last tribute meeting and he was most upset not to be called comrade. And I think we must mirror the Jinwala family by ensuring that in every succeeding generation we are members of the African National Congress. So Comrade Zav and Comrade Godridge, could I invite you? Dear comrades and friends of our aunt Freni Jinwala, dear celebrants of her amazing life, and dear mourners of, her, of the passing of her irreplaceable soul, thank you for honoring her at this official memorial service. I'm Zavari Rastamji, the eldest nephew of Freni Jinwala, and I'm here to speak on behalf of our family, consisting of my brothers Cyrus, Sorab, 
and their families and other extended family members, including those that might be linked in uh, via live stream, who are uh, many, many, many continents away. Thank you also for the many messages and the tributes accorded to her life's work, both tributes paid here as well as since her passing. These have been overwhelming and as a family we are humbled but also very, very proud of our aunt. She of course had two families, as has also been mentioned here. The first family is the family of our great movement, whose origins began during the struggles against European colonialism well before 1912. The other family was our nuclear family, and although there was, an, there was and is an overlap between the two families, we shared her in different ways. Much of what has been told today relates to Freni's contribution to and her relationship with components of our movement, but also her relationship with the evolving uh, democracy, parliamentary democracy uh, that we have. In contrast, I would like to briefly share some insights into our nuclear family's life with Freni Jinwala. And here I'll refer mainly to the experiences of myself and my brothers Cyrus and Sarab. Our interaction with Freni began in 1969, when our parents decided to send us to school in England, the backdrop being the increasing encroachment of apartheid principles into our education curricula. We were very fortunate that they were able to afford the privilege that we were given. At the time I was 11 years old, Cyrus was eight, and Sarab was a two-year-old baby. Our mother, Koshe Jinwala, or Koshe Rastanji, as she was also known, accompanied us for one year, during which she completed a program in hospital administration, and she then returned home with Sarab, where she continued her work in the public health service. Our mother Koshed was herself a formidable woman to whom we looked up to. She, as was Freni, were brought up by their parents, our grandparents, in accordance with the Zoroastrian faith that the president referred to. The, faith, the faith's theological basis is one of dualism, whereby we are born into a universe at war between the forces of good and the forces of evil. We are exhorted to espouse the principles of good words, good thoughts and good deeds, respect for humanity, respect for nature and all forms of life, and to oppose injustice wherever it arises. Most importantly, it's believed that nothing is preordained and that we as individuals must decide on our allegiance in this universal war, and we must live and die with our choices. Of course, these com concepts are, are common in, in all religions. And although Freni was not religious in the orthodox sense, she and our mother both lived their lives applying these principles. In 1970, after mom went back home, we were then enrolled in a boarding school with our aunt taking responsibility for us as our guardian. And Sorab, when he was a little older, also joined us. Our aunt Freni lived alone in a small flat in London, and she made room for us during the school holidays and half-term breaks. I can only describe our experience as tough love. She had a huge influence on us, we imbibed a work ethic of thoroughness and professionalism which has become deeply ingrained in our characters. She was a hard task mistress. We worked according to a roster of shared household responsibilities, and rightly so. We were trained to dust, to vacuum, to clean house, wash dishes, iron clothes, 
do general home maintenance and a whole range of other chores, including, you may be interested to hear, laying wall-to-wall -wall carpets, which, I hasten to add, Freni exhibited an expertise. During these times, Freni would often be out of the house conducting ANC business, and on days when we had been so instructed, often through yellow post-it messages, we would sit in trepidation when we heard her key turning in the front door lock. If she'd had a good day, we breathed sighs of, of relief. However, there were many occasions, particularly when she had had a bad day at the ANC Penton Street headquarters, where she would storm in, her roving, razor-sharp eye never failing to find a speck of dust on the carpet or some unpolished section of the flat. I'm sure some of you have uh, been subjected to that razor-sharp eye and mind. And we would be taken, as many of you have recounted, we, we, we'd be taken to task for achieving only 98% and not performing to her 100% expectation. Similarly, we imbibed the ethical values that our parents embraced, and these were reinforced through our interaction with Freni. Our consciousness of our privilege and of injustice had already taken root even before this, having had to understand why we had to leave our home, parents, friends, and other family at an early age and go and study elsewhere. Living with our aunt further enhanced our consciousness and understanding of the international nature of oppression and inequality and of the common struggles being waged elsewhere in the world. We were also sensitized to gender inequality. And knowing Freni as you all do, you can just imagine the impact on three young, impressionable boys growing up in Freni's feminist home. Aside from the toughness, our aunt was very, very caring, very supportive and very loving, making time for us in balancing the whirlwind of her liberation work in the same way that she cared for her aging mother in Cape Town in the late 1990s. In summary, our aunt Freni Jinwala had a profound impact on how we members of our nuclear family turned out, and we will love and cherish her efforts and her memory forever. After leaving Parliament in the early 2000s, Freni settled in Johannesburg, in the house next door to myself, my wife Betty and son Godrej. She kept very busy with a range of projects and responsibilities, some of which you've heard of in earlier tributes. But in recent years, her age forced her to slow down and we noticed a mellowing in her demeanor. But she was fiercely unhappy and critical of the degeneration in the leadership of our movement, in the leadership of public as well as private sector entities, and of the destruction of institutions that were built through great sacrifice and hard work. She also expressed considerable sorrow and regret at the extent to which this has permeated numerous layers of institutions and society. Yet, despite this, on seeing the green shoots of the reversal of this destruction, she expressed a hope that the next generation will take up the baton, live up to the original ideals, and rebuild. I would also like, it, with your permission, to take the opportunity to thank the other parts of our family, which President has also thanked uh, uh, Joey Lukiende Grand Zulu, who's, who was with Freni for more than a decade and a half, and also to her caregivers, who really have greatly eased Freni's life in recent times, and our family is, is indebted to you for that. I did want to say, I did want to end by saying, rest in peace, Freni Masi. Auntie Freni, but I suspect that if Freni Jinwala was here today, she would look at us much as she's looking at us in this photograph, looking at us straight in the eye, and she would probably say, no, 
I will not rest in peace. And I will come back to haunt you unless you get your act together and get our country back on track. So on behalf of Reni Noshir Jinwala's family, the families of myself, my brother Cyrus and Sorab, please accept our thanks for this great honor that the state and our people bestow on her. And in keeping with Freni's hope, Freni's great nieces and nephews would like to pay their brief tribute to their great aunt, with your permission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rasmussen. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate the words. And I think we will carry on her legacy. We will definitely sharpen our revolutionary con conviction to contribute to the ongoing transformation of our country. That's what we will promise you, the family, and we promise you. Can we have one of the children to come and speak? Fellow South Africans, distinguished guests, family and friends, it is my distinct pleasure to stand before you today on behalf of the youngest generation of the Genoala Rustinji Union, namely my cousins Leah, Hannah, Ava, Sarosh and I, in order to celebrate the legacy and life of our great aunt Freni Masi. Over the past week, our family has been inundated with messages of condolence. And on behalf of the entire family, I'd like to thank everyone for their kind words, gestures, and most of all, the deep-rooted desire to celebrate the life of this remarkable woman. It has been our pleasure to share Freni Masi with not just South Africa, but also with the world. I ironically, I'm not the biggest fan of public speaking, and yet here I find myself in the role of, of being a speaker. Um, although if Freni Masi were here today, she would probably say that a woman could do it better, and I think she's right. Both she and her sister Granny Koshid, together and independently epitomized strength, independence and resilience in the face of adversity and structural inequalities. I want to acknowledge the rich and diverse ways in which Freni Masi was able to touch not just the people who knew her, but also the ordinary South Africans. We want to highlight her contributions towards laying the legislative foundation for our country in the unique position of power that she held, especially as a woman of color. From an early age, my cousins and I came to learn about her strong character as well as to be very careful about our choice of words around her, I'll suffer through a lecture on why we were wrong and why she was right. But more importantly, the exposure we had and these conversations with her, uh, which were far beyond our comprehension at that age, enabled us to, um, enabled us, to, sorry, to think freely on critical issues. These interactions were instrumental in our character development as well as instilling the important values of equality, anti-colonialism, non-racialism, and democracy. And these values have permeated into our own respective worldviews and practices. She encouraged the participation of underrepresented groups to ensure that institutions reflected the society it served. And our hope is that her inclusive and intersectional approach filters through generations of leaders in the private and public sector, both in the future as well as the present. So despite her lectures and us sometimes feeling out of our depth, we will forever cherish the space that she gave, gave us to defend our opinions while thinking critically about the world around us. She kept us on our toes, she challenged us, and most of all, she allowed us to agree to disagree if we felt strongly. But most importantly, she didn't judge us. 
Friendly Marcy, there's no doubt that you contributed a great personal sacrifice towards a more tolerant, inclusive, and hopeful future for all. And as we hit, well, towards the, the final end of the service, my cousins and the family want to end off by saying that we're proud of you, not just because you are an outlier and the first to do many great things, but rather because from start to finish, you stay true to yourself. Thank you, Franny Masi, and thank you all. Thank you. Our next speaker now is Mr. Lawson Naidu, who is going to do the vote of thanks. Your Excellency the President, distinguished guests, as has been stated already, the family of Dr. Freni Noshir Janwala are deeply moved and grateful for the outpouring of love and support that they have received following her passing on the 12th of January. The messages of condolences, the sharing of personal memories and anecdotes of Freni over many decades and from people who, many, who knew her in many different capacities as a family member, lawyer, journalist, academic, activist and public servant have indeed been heartwarming. The tributes received within South Africa, from the rest of the continent and from across the globe have brought home to the family and to myself that Freni was a true internationalist who lent her support to struggles in many parts of the world, much of it directed at women's movements and women's initiatives, none more so than in Palestine. This memorial today is testament to the multifaceted legacy that Freni leaves behind. Thanks are due to the presidency for honoring comrade Freni the special official memorial. Our gratitude to all those who contributed towards today's arrangements. We also acknowledge the tributes paid to her today by the President and the various other speakers that I will not list, and the rich tapestry of tributes that we have heard, the anecdotes from comrades who have known her over many decades that tell of the many different sides of Comrade Freni. Your words and recollections will provide succor and a reminder, if one is needed, of the role of this extraordinary compatriot who committed her life to the struggle for freedom and then continued that work in prioritizing the buildings, building of institutions of governance in pursuit of our constitutional democracy. She is truly an icon of the liberation struggle and continued to be so through our fledgling democracy. Mention must be made about the staff at Parliament, current and former, who have been stung by the loss of Madam Speaker. Some of them are here with us today and many others have shared their condolences and reflected on working with Freni. One comment in particular stands out when it is said that she could be both inspiring and exasperating at the same time. Those who knew and worked with Freni can, I am sure, relate to this, but this reflects the impact that she had on those around her. Having personally known Freni for more than 37 years, and worked with her in various roles, I too can attest to this. We have all benefited from having known her. Comrade Barbara, I had many, many howevers. And even as I was putting together this short input, I had a voice in my head of Comrade Freni saying, no Lawson, say it like this, not like that. 
Thanks are also due to the medical professionals and the caregivers that have been mentioned who attended to Freni as her health deteriorated. They enabled her to enjoy a level of comfort in her own home before she left us peacefully. As we say our final goodbye to Freni Jinwala, known to us as Comrade Freni, Freni Marcy, Auntie Freni, Mom Freni, Dr. G, Dr. Jinwala, or Madam Speaker. The abiding lesson for all of us to take is to seek to emulate her commitment to the values and the principles of integrity and to apply these equally in our personal and professional uh, capacities. Hambagash le comrade Freni, rest well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naitu. Um, thank you so much. I think we now are going to thank all the, the relatives and the family members, all of them, that have allowed us to have this memorial service. The president, the, the president of, of the country, Bab Matamela, Bab Tabumpeki, cabinet ministers, everyone, leaders from all political parties, the speaker of the National Assembly, all the speakerage from the National Assembly, the Chief Whip, from the National Assembly, members of Parliament, members of the Legislature, members of the ANC, members of the ANC Women's League and the Youth League, all Alliance structures that are present today. We truly appreciate this. If you are not here, these memorial services will not be like this. Our Premier of the province, thank you, Premier. We really appreciate that you have managed to everyone uh, DSG, we know you have played a very critical role in ensuring that our members are able to come and be with us today to do this dignified memorial service. Kamama, I think we all agree that that was a loyal member of the ANC, a disciplined member of the ANC, a committed member of the ANC. I wanted Mama to show the youth league that the indolent toy children are mixed. Mangiti zuzo manam, babo nabanduan bale power, you don't grab it or force elders to go out. You work with them, you've taught me. There are certain things that, and the certain protocols that you wanted me to do and learn. So this is how it should be, youth league leaders. Si kala ganje akusuke guliwe. And I think if funeral kamama, memorial service kamama, it's exactly how it should be when we are all together in one room. Siabonga Rakul, Mama, mending over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you to our comrade MEC. Thank you for an excellent leadership of the program. We thank the family for allowing us this opportunity. We thank His Excellency, the President, Madam Speaker, former President Becky, former Speaker Mbete, and all distinguished guests present here. I'm told in diplomatic speak, all distinguished includes everyone. So I could now ask us all if we could rise and allow His Excellency, President Ramaphosa, to depart the room. Probably President Mbeki would want to depart. And then I will ask that we depart in an orderly manner. Thank you very much.